Hey, this is your boy Joey from the So Wizard Podcast. You are listening to the Nerd Podcast Mafia, entertainment your ears can't refuse. Welcome to the continued podcast adventures of Superhero Speak. But I think many of the people that love this character and that love superheroes in general have used these stories as inspiration to say, you know what? I'm going to do something good in the world. I'm going to make a difference like my hero when I was a kid. That is my fondest memory of it because when, you, when you're doing comic books, you want them to affect people. Right. You want people to care. You want, you want to strike emotions. And I knew that that clone saga was striking a lot of emotions. Can you yep. imagine Pulp Fiction starring Goofy and Mickey Mouse? I can totally imagine that. <laughs> I'm Don't sure somebody's written that one too. Pounder with cheese in France, Mickey. <laughs> what? <laughs> the boy with cheese, Mickey. Yeah. <laughs> I can totally See? I, I, would, I would watch the hell out of that movie. Yes, I gladly saw, sacrifice that my, my progeny to you, a mighty Marvel beast. <laughs> <laughs> but Neil Adams is somewhere going, hmm? it's, uh, it's my time. Uh... <laughs> How do you measure success? Hey, everyone. You're listening to Superhero Speak, and I'm your host, Dave. And I'm JD. And John is off this week, ladies and gentlemen. Um, but in his place, we have a very special guest with us. Um, he has been in the Wolf of Wall Street. Uh, he actually was just recently on an episode of Madam Secretary, um, which I'm going to bring up in a minute in the conversation. And you guys are going to know him most as Sam Stein from The Punisher on Netflix. So everyone, please welcome Michael Nathanson to the show. How are you, sir? Yay! Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I was expecting someone to clap or applaud or be in the studio audience or something with that introduction. Uh, I'm doing well. Nice nice to talk to you guys. Cool. So um, it, just, you know, kind of – actually, you know what? Uh, just to kind of start things off here, I, I have to tell you um, we've only had a few actors on the show, so sometimes I get nervous uh, with actors. But then this morning you tweeted out a picture of you and your family all in matching Darth Vader pajamas. Correct. And I'm like, okay, he's one of us. So the- <laughs> Yeah, you don't have to worry about me. I'm a huge dork. Come on, give me a break. <laughs> I just happen to be an actor. I'm also a lot of other things besides an actor. So I'm just, yes, I am a, um, it's funny, you know, I, I, I've told this to a lot of people. Like, I am like a fan who like made it into like fan to fan lore cool, or whatever you want to call it. Or like, like I switch sides, like. The, uh, like the the uh, the upside down is like celebrities, I guess. And, right. Like, there's like a wall, you know, a gooey wall formed, and I like crawled through it um, into the celebrity under, you know, upside down world. And so I I don't know which I don't know where I am more, but uh, I definitely am a gigantic geek. So you're yes. Will. I am Will. I'm Will without the. Uh, yeah, I guess I'm Will. <laughs> I don't know. So is is acting something you always wanted to do? We're like Barb guys. <laughs> Um, sorry, what would you? What was that? I'm sorry. Was is acting something you've always wanted to do? Yeah, it beats working, right? <laughs> um, no, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was, you know, I did it when I was a kid, and um, I've always been kind of interested in it. I didn't really get serious about it until college. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it it's one of those things that I think it just kind of like bites you, and you can't like a radioactive spider, and you can't stop the effects of it. Mm-hmm. And um, even if you quit, a lot of you know actors who like give it up at some point in their lives. Um, they're always still kind of itching to do it again. It, it, I always say it chose me as opposed to me choosing it, but it, um, you know, when I, I was always a kind of a precocious kid and like wanted to be the class clown, but a lot of, in a lot of ways I was pretty, you know, neurotic and, and anxiety ridden and, and shy. And I think being other people and sort of like performing and trying to make people laugh and was always kind of my way to get over that. And I think, you know, that's what a lot of actors start out with, but, um, but yeah, it's, I love it. You know, when, I, when I'm able to do it, I love it. The business part of it, not as much, but um, <laughs> the actual doing of it, you know, is, is pretty spectacular when you get a chance to do some. Cool. So has it um, always been film and TV or have you done? Uh... I don't know. No, no. I was a, I was a theater guy. I went okay. to theater school in Chicago and um, studied theater for, for a while and um, did a ton of theater all over the country regionally and, um, and in New York and, uh, I even toured with the Lion King for uh, a, a while around the country, mm-hmm. playing various characters and puppets. Um, so theater was always like, it's theater is kind of where I trained. And, um, you know, as, as I went through my career, I, I just found, I, I think I always wanted to be a film actor. I always wanted to be in the movies. But I think as a younger actor, you get into theater and it's kind of like the thing to do. And it's gritty and dirty and you're, you're mixing it up and you feel like you're, 
you're changing, you're going to change the world. And then pretty soon your bank account's pretty empty and, <laughs> you know, you right. realize that, oh, there's a whole, you know, this is not exactly how things work. And so, I, and I also think I just, I got a little bit burned out doing it. It's, it's a grind. It's a lot of work. Um, it's a lot of listening to a lot, a lot of other actors talk about their process, which I don't really care to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of like to do my thing. And I, I love collaboration, but I, I, I love going to a film set and, uh, you know, working with other actors, mixing it up, and then being able to go home and kind of turn it off. Um, where, in, where in Chicago did you study? I went to Northwestern. Oh, cool. I'm a Chicago guy, too. Perked my interest. Are you in Are you in Chicago right now? So, at the current moment, I'm living. Oh, whereabouts? So, South L. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I uh, I went to Northwestern. I you know I grew up in New York City, and then I um, I went to uh, found myself in the Midwest for college. So I loved I loved it out there, though. I miss. It. Cool. So something I've always been curious about, and uh, maybe it's just uh, my perception, but it seems like with stage acting, you have to um, you know memorize your lines. You're dependent on all your uh, once you're live and in front of an audience, depending on all the, all the other actors to hit their cues and remember their lines and hit their marks. Right. Um, that's important, obviously, in film acting, but you have a lot of chances to get it right. Is that, you feel that's true or? Well, they say that theater is an actor's medium because no matter what you do in rehearsal, no matter what a director tells you, no matter what anything happens, when you're actually doing it, it's you and you have total control over your performance. Now, if you're an asshole, and you just want to do whatever you want and ignore the director and ignore your other actor. You know, you won't work for very long or you at least get a terrible reputation, but it is true in the sense of like you have, you have control over it. Yeah. But the, but the the shitty thing about it is you have control yet you get one shot at it. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, you get a chance to do it another night of performance. But um, what I love about, I I love the idea that um, acting for film and TV, it's, it's more like, it's almost like being a sculptor. You know, there's like a or, or, or a painter. But I, I would say sculpt, sculpt, sculptor is, is more sort of apropos in, in the sense of like you're con- you can constantly sort of like retouch and refine and go back and take stuff away and put stuff back on and, and you know, kind of craft craft that that performance you're doing. And, and you don't get too many takes. Mm-hmm. If you if you got to be careful, <laughs> you know, about, about doing too many takes or wanting too many takes. You got to come pretty, you know, pretty much on your game. And, and but, you know, if, if the director's worth their salt, they're going to help you and help you get the best performance out of you that they can. But yeah, at the end of the day, the flip side of that is that, you know, the director takes your performance, they edit it, they went through a, you know, a whole machine of, of opinions and whatever. And then what ends up on the screen is not always, you know, what you brought to it or, or mm-hmm. what you've intended, you know, they can manipulate your performance. So there's, there's pod is positives and negatives to both kinds of acting. Um, I, I just like there's something very, I, I don't like having to rely. There's something exciting about performing in front of an audience, but I don't like to have to rely on an audience. If that right. makes sense. And the idea of not having to rely on an audience is very freeing to me as an actor because I feel like I can. I ha- it's a different kind of control that I then have over my performance. And uh, yeah, it's exciting. No, but I, different. I, I totally understand that in the fact that for many years uh, I'm a musician and I've been in a lot of different bands. And there is a unwritten contract with an audience that they're going to pay attention and they're going to react uh-huh. to what you're doing on stage. And if they don't, it just removes all the energy from what you're doing. Yeah. Well, I don't know how it's this way, but like every time I do a, a show, a live show, um, you, you know, like within five minutes, whether, whether you've got the audience or not, you mm-hmm. know, whether they're a quote unquote good audience or not. And I think I, I, I just got so sick of that, like going out there, ready to do my best, feeling good, starting to do good work and then just realizing that the audience that night was, you know, tired or older or not into it or the wrong people or wandered into the wrong show, whatever, it, whatever the case may be, knowing that it's not me and then having to like be out there and like be that performing monkey for two hours, that just killed me. And I think it just, the grind of that just like got to me. I, I would imagine being a musician and touring is, it's sort of a similar thing. Oh yeah. I mean, sometimes you play the local bar and, uh, they just started having bands and all the regulars are just sitting at the bar and they don't pay attention at all of what you're doing. That's yeah, perfect. After the first song, you just don't want to be there anymore, but you're getting paid. So you have to stay. Uh, yeah, man. And just, yeah. yeah. And, and so, so I've, I've, I've definitely, I haven't done theater in a bit. It's been a few years since I was on stage. I, I'd like to go back and do something maybe, but uh, my heart is really in the movies and, and on TV and, and making my own stuff. And um, yeah, I really, I love it. I love the craft of it. I've really fallen, fallen head over heels. So um, I had mentioned in the intro, Madam Secretary and. Yeah, that was just last week. Yeah. And the funny thing about that is I've never watched the show before. Okay. 
So my wife watches a lot of TV and she DVRs everything and watches it whenever she, you know, gets a chance to. Right. And the other night we didn't have anything else to watch. And it was right after we had booked you, she put it on. Right. And I'm like, ah, I'll watch this, you know. And all of a sudden, oh, <laughs> there you were. And I'm like, is he a regular on the show? And she's like, no, this is the first time he's ever been on and probably the last. So I don't know. <laughs> Cause apparently there's a lot. It's, it's one of those shows where they do have a lot of revolving guest stars on the show. So, um, I found the episode very interesting. Um, and Time, timely, huh? Yes. Yes. <laughs> they yeah. were, I felt like they were beating us over the head with something subtly. Did you get yeah, that feeling? <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Um, I think you know where their politics. Um, I, yeah, I actually really liked it. I thought it was a pretty exciting episode. I, I, it's possible my character could come back, you know, and they, they, they often introduce characters from the cabinet that haven't been there before, and then they come back for, for other slots. I think they mm-hmm. kind of, they almost set my character up a little to come back, I think, in a way that, like, oh, this guy could make, you know, he's now part of the team, in a way. Right, um, right. But I just loved, I just loved the opportunity with Jelko Ivanek, who I just think is one of the greatest actors. That's, uh, he was in Three Billboards, and he was in, uh... Right, right. Uh, McDonough stuff. He's a f- fantastic actor, and, uh... Yeah, that was, it's a really nice group of people. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun to do. Um, and Eric Stoltz was one of the producers of that show, so it was fun to get to hang out with him and um, not ask him about Back to the Future. <laughs> I, really, I really wanted to so badly. But no. Yeah, that was that was a fun little uh, – yeah. So thanks thanks for the shout-outs. If anyone wants to catch it, it's on CBS On Demand, I believe. Somewhere. Yes, yes. Um, so, so a character like that, you know, he's put into a – I don't want to – for people who haven't seen, it, I don't want to give too much away, but he's put into a situation huh. um, that's not a very comfortable situation, and then he's given basically a decision to make where he could either look like a big jerk or yeah. do what you know, you know, or 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 do what's right. And you know, when you get a role like that, do you think about how would I do this if I was in this situation? Yeah, you know, it's um. I- I wouldn't presume to know about, you know, being, having a position of power in a government and right. knowing exactly, you know, I have my own politics and my own opinions about things. I mean, I think I, I think I probably would make a pretty decent politician. Not that I'm a good liar necessarily, but I think that I can, <laughs> you know, I think as an actor, you know, and as a storyteller, I think that's, you know, a lot of that is embedded in that job. But um, right. yeah, I mean, you know, when, when I, I think, I think it's important for the government to have certain checks and balances. And I think that it's, you know, it, at the end of the day, it is it is an individual's responsibility to do the right thing, you know. But I think my guy was pretty smart. We're talking around something. But half, most of your audience probably is like, what are they talking about? What is this episode? Right. I mean, because uh, it was just last week. So that's kind of why I want to not give it yeah, away. Yeah. Yet. Essentially, folks I haven't seen, essentially the, the, the president becomes sort of incapacitated. He starts making sort of ridiculous, you know, uh, decisions about things and wanting to go to war with Russia and all these things. And Everyone's worried about his sort of well-being, and they're trying to figure out a way to sort of strip him of his power temporarily to kind of get a grip on what's going on before the world is plunged into war. And it kind of rests on my character's shoulders. I end up becoming someone who has the power to either say yay or nay in terms of them uh, having that having that like uh, stopgap between him and what's going on. And and so yeah, I mean, I, it, it was I mean, it was fun to have like all of these great actors like sort of begging and pleading and trying to convince me of something. It was an easier thing to play than me having to convince them of something. Uh, True. Felt it felt fairly powerful. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I, you know, I, no matter what side of the politics you're on, what side of the fence you're on politics wise, I think, you know, it's important to know when to say no, but it's also important to know, to, to, to understand that there is a system in place and there is, there are checks and balances already in place and there's a way of doing things in a way not to do things. And I think, you know, sometimes shit happens. We elect certain people and you have to just sort of like live with your decision and then, you know, do what you have to do. Right. To get through it. Um, but man, I wish we could figure out a way to sort of circumvent with some of the things that are going on right now. And, um, yeah. Yeah. It's a trick. It's a trick. It's a tricky conversation to have. I don't want to, I don't want to get too political with you guys, but, um, but yeah, the episode is, is fairly political. Yes. Well, it's a, it has to be, right? It's Madam it Secretary. Yeah. <laughs> it is a political. Show. Mm-hmm. Yes. Cool. So, um, uh, then we'll, we'll, we'll move to the world of, of high finance. Um, what was it like working with Leonardo DiCaprio in uh, Wolf of Wall Street? Yeah, it was pretty weird. Um, a lot of people asked me about it. You know, I, I had a small part in that movie. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a huge thing. I, I had just done a pretty big part in a Steven Soderbergh movie before that. And then I, I sort of went from working with Soderbergh that year to working with Scorsese, which was a very different experience. Then. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, 
I've told this story before, you know, I had a moment with, uh, on set where I was standing next to Scorsese. I was standing in between Scorsese and DiCaprio talking about a scene. Scorsese's talking a mile a minute and DiCaprio's in a cigarette and kind of like brooding and kind of like, and we're all, we're all in this. And I, I, everyone's voices started getting very like faint and echoey. And I just was, what, where am I? What is happening? This is like pinch myself kind of moment. I had to, it, it was weird. I had to remind myself that I was there to do a job and, and go home. And I got to be on set for a couple of weeks. It was fun. And, um, you know, it was one of those things where it was like you're thrown into like the sort of celebrity vortex and um, you kind of have to like own your shit and, and do it and do a good job. And, you know, uh, you know, I got to call Martin Scorsese Marty, which I found a, a, a career, a career high for me <laughs> just to say that, you know, it's like every actor's dream to like work with Scorsese and call him Marty. I did that. So that's uh, check. Check that off a bucket list. There you go. <laughs> um, it was a good time, man. It was fun. It was fun. You know, it was it was uh, you could tell there was a lot of crazy shit going on on set and a lot of investment in those characters investment in the playing of those characters by a lot of those guys but um yeah it was fun it was fun i got to inter- uh, improv with rob reiner in one scene which uh, i don't think made the cut but um that was kind of an interesting little thing we did and yeah man it's just weird you know when you're in your career when you're doing these things like sometimes you just find yourself in these weird jobs with like insanely famous people and sometimes you find yourself like on a shitty indie film changing in a Starbucks bathroom. And you're like, I don't, I don't, you know, it could change month to month, job to job. You never know which end is up, but um, you know, you just sort of have to keep that log of, of weird stories and weird interactions. Right. And as long as you're, so you, oh, go ahead. Go ahead Steve. No, no, no. You're <laughs> Guys, don't fight over me. There's plenty of people. <laughs> so, so I was going to say, so as long as you're constantly working, that's a good thing though. I just want to work all the time. There. I mean, I, I think I've reached a point in my career where I'm, I'm sort of not willing to work at a certain level of, um, what I might see as unprofessional. Like, I don't care about money per se on every job. Like, I'll work for very little money um, if, if, if I believe in the script and I like the people involved. But, uh, yeah, I used to say yes way more than I do now, but I certainly am a workhorse, and I, I just like – I do like to work. Yeah. So you talked about being uh, kind of a nerd that made it. What, what's kind of your relationship stuff, and how did you grow up, and what were the things you were into? Uh, well, I mean, look, I'm first and foremost, I'm a Star Wars nerd. Um you know, that was, I came of age really in the eighties and as a, as a little kid. And, you know, that was my, that was always my jam. And I think that's just sort of like that laid the foundation for me as like a creative person. Like, you know, so I think I was always sort of destined to be nerdy and geeky in my tastes and in my, and in my life. Um, but yeah, I was a star Wars kid and I was a big movie buff and, um, I saw every single movie. I wasn't a huge comic reader. I definitely read comic books and bought comic books and, um, still have a ton of them. Um, but I, I, I wasn't, I was more interested in sort of like movie pop culture and geek culture sort of before it was what it is today. You know, like mm-hmm. I was a big toy collector. I was a big, I guess every kid is, but I was like obsessed with my geek boys, obsessed with my GI Joe, obsessed with my star Wars stuff. Um, I was obsessed with Indiana Jones. I was the kid at every birthday party where they take a picture of all the kids at the birthday party and everyone's dressed in normal clothes. And there's me in like full Indiana Jones gear. or like me dressed like head to toe as Superman or Batman or whatever. Um, so I was always like, I was always weird. I was always cosplaying. I was cosplaying way before cosplay. Um, for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was kind of where, where it all started. And, uh, you know, and I was a huge Ghostbusters fan and, and I've just taken all of these, all of these likes and, and proclivities and just, injected my adulthood with them <laughs> or like, or just kept them going. You know, the baton kept getting passed from one age to the next. And um, mm-hmm. yeah, here I am. I, I mean, I, I, you know, I go to comic cons, I buy toys, I buy Funkos. I like, you know, I love old movie posters. Like I, you know, I have a remote control Ghostbusters car sitting right behind me currently. Like I'm, I, there was a period where I could not stop buying uh, the interactive Star Wars ornaments that Hallmark kept making, where you <laughs> the little scenes where you press the button and it had pre-recorded voices from the movies. Those were the best. Mm-hmm. Yes, I, I've got a little mini collection of those. Like I'm a weirdo, you know. But but um, but yeah, you know, I know I don't think I in my wildest dreams I ever thought I'd be in like a franchise show like The Punisher or like be in the MCU or you know I, I don't think that was my goal. I think you know my dream was definitely in to be you know somewhere in the Star Wars universe. That would be that would be. That'd be the brass ring for me, but like Punisher was pretty goddamn close. Um, and I just love, I love having that responsibility of carrying that, that, that torch for the, for the fans, you know, because I, I love this stuff. I, I love it the way the fans love it. Um, you know, I, I've told people that, and you guys can look at my, you may have seen it on my social media, you know, like I mentioned Mark Hamill and something. And then like, he tweeted this whole really funny message to me 
And then I took a picture of the tweet he sent me with my lightsaber and then tweeted back at him and then picture of all that and then put that on my Instagram. Like, I'm a nerd. Like, I totally fanboyed out for, like, weeks when that happened to me and wanted to impress all my friends and impress all my fans with with that, you know? Because, like, and people are like, well, now you know how we feel about you. And I'm like, not really. But, like, it's how people feel about this stuff. I mean, like, Mm -hmm. and, and I feel that way, too. And so I don't. I don't ever feel like I'm not a part of this. I kind of feel like I got lucky and now I get to sort of, because I was always acting and doing gigs, but like this is, this feeds my geek soul. And then I get to talk to guys like you and, you know, I get to like interact with Funko on Twitter. Like Funko and I like send messages back and forth. If you, if, if ever I post something about Funko and talk to them, they'll talk back to me. We go through these like long conversations. Like, you know, I'm looking at my Funkos now, like that's cool to me, you know, like that's amazing to have that opportunity and so with great power comes great responsibility and i i wield it uh i wield it well i think or i tried to was that a very long-winded answer I'm sorry. yes no but the perfect it works yes i feel like you've listened to the show before um <laughs> did uh did you have you watched the toys that made us i you know i i uh, it's on my queue i started okay. watching it and i got i know the, the first episode of the star wars stuff so yes. i I was on a plane. I was on a plane to uh, Paradise City Comic Con a couple weeks ago, and uh, down to Miami. And I, um, I started watching it, and then I felt because I, I do that on planes. <laughs> but I'm gonna get back to it. I know I'm dying to see it. Um, my parents threw all that shit out. I'm like every kid, right? Every kid's parents threw all that shit out. Yes. Right? Most, yeah. Parents are. What true. the hell? <laughs> I finally got into Stranger Things in two. We, my wife and I have been putting it off forever, and we finally started watching it. And that scene where uh, it just killed me. The scene where uh, the mom says to. Uh, says to Mike, you know, you have to throw, you have to give away two boxes of your toys. Remember, and he's looking at the Millennium Falcon, and you're just like, don't, don't put that <laughs> in the box. I was like screaming the way like someone might scream at like a horror movie. No, that was like the most horrible moment of like anything I've watched in so long, having him consider giving away that beautiful, pristine Millennium Falcon that killed me. Yes, no uh, matter what you encounter in the Upside Down, that's the worst thing that's ever going to happen to you. That was the worst thing. Yes. I could take all that other stuff, but I was like, do not. No. I was like literally screaming at the television. My wife is like, please calm down. Because she could give a rat's ass about any of this stuff, about all this, you know, toys and all this stuff. I'm relegated to my corner, my man corner, as I call it. All right. So I learned, I'm not going to give it away if you don't know the answer. I learned okay. something really interesting from the Star Wars episode. Do you know why the action figures were three and three quarters inches? Oh, wait. I did know this. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, yes, because he, pin- he, he, pin- he did the pinching thing, right? Yes, yes, He yes. put his fingers out. He was like, this big. At, at, yeah, they talked about that in the, in the, in the documentary. documentary, and it was just like, I was like, are you serious? Just because yes. he put his hands out? They so literally they measured it, and that's um, how they came up with the size. I mean, but don't, isn't that great, though? Like, of course that's why. Like, <laughs> fantastic. Right. Cool. And then, of course, we have the Black Series now, and it's, no, they will be this <laughs> make them what we want. It's like, all right. As I'm looking at my black series, Jedi Master uh, Luke Skywalker. So um, so as somebody who loves all this stuff and yeah. feels they carry the torch of uh, nerdum into what they do, right. um, how did The Punisher come about for you? You know, it was, it was an audition like any other audition. Um, I knew the casting director. She called my agent. We've got this audition for him. And I went in and, um, you know, I, I auditioned for Micro first actually. Oh, okay. uh, and, uh, although it wasn't called micro and it wasn't called the Punisher, but I figured it, uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> it was like, wink, wink, then the Punisher. Right. Um, yeah. And then, and then when that didn't go, they, they liked my audition, but something a bit different. Um, I think they wanted to get, get away from the comics version and do something a little bit, a little bit, uh, a little bit different. And, um, this other role came up and they called me back in and they were like, you know, they really loved your other audition, but they, this other, this is, I think they feel like it might be better fit. And then I came in and, they gave me some dummy sides that weren't from the show, but uh, a couple of FBI partners on a roof talking about why they joined the, the uh, why they joined the FBI, and you know I did the scene and and I never had to audition again. I got cast off of that. You know, I, it was a couple months later that they told me I I, I got this job, and I, I think I'm pretty sure I was the first one cast in the show after Burn. Obviously, Burnthal was in the show, but I was the first one cast, and I think they didn't tell me about it because they were still waiting to cast everybody else. But I was one of the first. Um, but yeah, it was insane. And you know, you just, just one of those things, you know, you wake up one day, you don't have an audition. You wake up another day, you got an audition for the Punisher. You wake up two months later, you're in the Punisher. That's being an actor, man. Yeah. Did, uh, so I'm kind of curious. I don't know how things work with, uh, the Netflix series. Like, do they give you 
the entire script beforehand or do, just as what you need when you're recording? Because did you know going in the ultimate fate of your character? No, uh, I knew I knew what was going to happen to my character. Yes. Okay. Um, I had not read all the scripts. They don't give you more than sometimes they give you like one script in advance. If you really beg and plead, they might give you more than that. But honestly, they're writing them as we go and, and revising them. And, you know, they have a plan and an arc for the entire series already. But, um, you know, not every single episode is written out. But um, I didn't know exactly where it was going to go. Um, you know, I had conversations with writers and Steve Lightfoot, the showrunner, creator. And, um, you know, there's different directors for every episode. So you got to sort of negotiate that. But um, I knew his fate. I didn't tell Amber what was going to happen to me. I knew and she purposely didn't tell her at first. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want her to know because I didn't want... I didn't want it to taint our relationship. I wanted her to feel like, you know, this was, I wanted it to be a, a, a shocking for her on some, she found out probably a month before, okay. uh, or a couple months before we shot it. But, um, it was, um, yeah. So you kind of know, you kind of know a bit, a bit of your character and a bit of what's going on, but yeah, you're, uh, you're left a little in suspense. Right. And, and just going forward, we're going to talk about the Punisher a little bit. Yeah. And just for our audience, I mean, we already did a full on review where we spoiled the show pretty badly. <laughs> Um, it's been out for over two months now, so. Yeah, ever, if you didn't watch it already, that's. Right, right, right. Um, actually, for, I have a, I have a question. One of my coworkers wants to know, um, and I'm not, you weren't in the scene, so I don't know if you know the answer or not. The, the Mustang showdown, right? So we had yeah. the, we had the, I think it was the 69 Mustang versus a, a, a new Mustang. Right. And of course, the show, we saw them total the Mustang. Did they actually total it in the show? <laughs> All right. <laughs> I, I think so. I uh, think so. He's he's a big car guy, and that that made him very sad. Yeah. So uh, let's just say I I don't know in that way. Uh, okay. All right. I wish I had a better answer. But, uh, and FYI, I'm not a car guy, so they're they're welcome. To do it. <laughs> it's just a bunch of metal, glass. Who cares? It's not a. It's not as valuable as a plastic figure, vinyl figure in a box, right? <laughs> Or the original Millennium Falcon. Yeah. Exactly. Shed, tears, tears shed on my desk. Um, well, before you took a role in, the, in Punisher, did you have like yes, any, um, did you have anything with the character? I know you were a comic fan, but any the other interpretations, the other films of it, like, did you have any opinions on the property as a whole going in? Yeah. I mean, I thought Dolph Lundgren was a way better Punisher than Don Bernthal. <laughs> <laughs> I told him that to his face. I was like, I was like, it's nice to meet you. You were okay in The Walking Dead, but also like, Dolph Lundgren, like, fuck, like, this is not even close. Now, uh, what did I, what, what, were, what are we talking about? Um, I saw, yeah, I mean, those other, those other movies suck, right? Except for, I mean, Warzone is a great, sort of, almost like 70s exploitative, sort of like violent blood bloodbath. Right. Um, it's like so over the top. I think it doesn't take itself completely seriously. I, I don't, I, I don't know how it could. So I think that there's like fun stuff in that movie, but it's also like, it's gore for gore's sake. And obviously, the eighties one was kind of like, whatever. I thought Tom Jane was like a cool choice for the character. I, have you seen Tom Jane's like short film that he made? That was sort of like his own version of like a sequel to his movie. Yeah, The, the laundry one. Yeah. That was yeah, pretty yeah. cool. That was pretty cool. I thought that was pretty, um, but yeah, you know, I definitely didn't think that they'd ever done the character justice. And then when Bernthal did daredevil season two and we got to the scene in the cemetery, I was like, there he is. There's the Punisher. Boom. Done. You know, the way that like Christopher Reeve will always be Superman. The way that, right? Sorry, Christian Bale, Michael Keaton will always be Batman, like, or maybe Adam West, old school. But um, there's just certain times when, like, you know, Heath Ledger became the Joker, and like, as amazing as Jack Nicholson is, like, no one's ever going to do the Joker like that. Like that just became so iconic immediately. Um, I felt like Bernthal etched himself into the iconic iconography of the Punisher in that in that scene, and uh, from there on, he was the guy. Um, so I was just excited to work with him. I thought he nailed it. And I was just so excited to be a part of his version of that in his own show. No, definitely. And, you know, I think Marvel is really just keeps knocking out of the park with the Netflix shows. Um, not only story wise, but character wise, like Sam Stein at the beginning of when they first introduced the character, he comes off as this, I'm just watching, covering my butt, keeping my nose clean. I want to just keep my job and get my paycheck. And then by the time, you know, he meets his end, you're upset, you know, cause he, he shows that he's a really good partner and he's a really good guy and he wants to do the right thing. And you take such a great journey with that character. Um, thanks man. Do you, you know, 
So it was calculated. <laughs> yeah. Like, did yeah, you feel that when you read the part? Yeah. I mean, I, I got a, I got a sense of, you know, they, they told me kind of where he was going and kind of what the, you know, the, you get a sense of kind of like, even in, you know, in between the lines, just a couple of episodes, you're like, Oh, I see what they're doing here with the story and what they're doing for Dina's character. I mean, for my character and okay, you know, how do I, and I, I had a certain way that I wanted to play, you know, I really bought into Lightfoot sort of like, all the president's men meets the French connection of seventies vibe mm-hmm. that the show has, you know, it's shot in that way. It's, it's colored in that way. Um, it's got that grittiness to it. It's got that claustrophobic feel to it. And, you know, I played him as sort of a throwback to those guys. You know, like not exact, not a Popeye Doyle. But I just made a really esoteric reference. <laughs> yes, he, you did. <laughs> he, he people as Gene Hackman in the French connection. If you haven't seen it, amazing movie. Um, you know, I, I felt like I was definitely doing, a character, a sort of a throwback character in a lot of ways. And there was sort of things I wanted to do and shades of a certain shading of how I was doing it. But then, um, yeah, I knew the journey was going to be from him sort of getting his balls back or getting his mojo back, realizing that, you know, instead of being annoyed by this person, she could actually inspire him again. Right. Uh, and, and he could in turn inspire her back you know, and, and maybe make her realize that there's more to this than just, you know, justice, seeking justice, you know, cause she's a, a punisher in her own way. Um, you know, he's her micro in a right. lot of ways. And so, yeah, you know, I mean, that was a, the same way you, you know, you, when you're doing a play, you know, you get the whole play and you understand the character arc and the journey that you're taking from start to finish. And in a, in a TV series, it's different because you don't have every single script, but you have enough conversations, you get enough tidbits. You're like, okay, I get a sense of, you know, where this needs to start and where this needs to end. And then you kind of, you know, you develop real relationships with your fellow actors. You, you know, Amber and I became very close friends and we still are very good friends. And you just kind of, figure out how that, you know, as that develops, your relationship within the show develops and you kind of let it all be organic in some ways and, and kind of figure it out. But, um, you know, you, you craft certain moments and certain scenes and you figure out a way to sort of, you, you want, I mean, that's the, I, I mean, I really appreciate you saying that because that's the highest compliment an actor can get is that like, you know, that, that an actor creates a journey where a character goes from one place to, and ends up in a different place. And that journey of the authenticity of that journey is successful. That's, that's all I ever hope for from any of my work, truly. No, no, definitely. I, and I mean it. I mean, it's, you know, I, again, I didn't really care too much for your character in the, in the first couple episodes, but then by the time and it's like, Oh no, you can see it coming too. You know, you get yeah. that feeling and it's just like, no, don't do this, you know? And <laughs> yeah, I mean, definitely. And that's a, the, the question I kind of have too is as an actor, right? And, and as a self-proclaimed nerd, um, Oh, just look at my social media. I'm a nerd. When you get okay, when you get into the when you get the role, right? You're like, oh, I broke into the MCU. But then you find out that you know your character is going to die. How do you feel about that? Well, how, how can you complain? Do you know what I mean? Like, okay. Got to look at it that way. You can't. You can never look at it, things in, in a in a. To me, that's like a negative way of of looking at it because I'm not saying that. Huh, why are you being so negative? No. Um, <laughs> no, I just mean that. Like, sure. Would I have liked to continue with it? Yes. Flip side of that is, you know, I get to do other stuff now. You know, I get to challenge myself in other ways as an actor and, and get to do other uh, projects and things and, and use this as a, and I don't, I don't always have this. I'll always be in the MCU. I'll always be a part of this. And you never know where my, where my membership will end up in some ways. You know, you never, you know, characters come back and characters, they do prequels and they do things. And I'm not expecting any of that necessarily, but mm-hmm. you know, the way I see it is how many people get a chance have their own Marvel wiki page. How many people get a chance to like, yeah, be, be in the MCU. Like, you know, you're lucky to get as an actor, one episode or two lines. And, right. and I got a really memorable character with a huge arc as a series regular in one of the most iconic Marvel properties ever made. True. That's a good um, way to I look at it. I can't be anything but grateful. To be honest. I just can't, I can't be, I can't be anything but grateful. I'm, that's just how I feel, you know? And, and I could absolutely go cry in a corner and be like, Oh, they're going to start shooting season two this year. And you know, I'm not a part of it, but that's my journey, you know, like everyone has a journey and I think you just have to trust it and, and own it. And, you know, there are certainly actors and characters and you guys probably can think of them pretty quickly that have languished in shows like this, that are characters that no one cared about, you know, that have gone on for years and they're just like, eh, whatever, you know, I got to be like an interesting, complex character with a cool arc and I got murdered by one of the greatest villains in the history of Marvel comics. So like not too shabby, you know what I'm saying? No, that definitely. That is such a healthy attitude. I mean, it's, it's refreshing. 
I don't yeah. think a lot of people have that kind of attitude well, anymore. It's all, it's all bullshit. I'm, I'm dying. <laughs> I'm well, and it is Marvel's. There's always, uh, Tahiti, Project Tahiti. They could, they brought right. back Colson, so. I know. That's what everyone tells me. Uh, well, let me just say my, my, my relationship with Marvel is not dead. I've got a little something going on. I can't talk about it yet, but, um, you know, they recognized in me that they want to keep me around. So, so somewhere, somehow I'll, I'll pop up again. So you'll see. Uh, hmm. I have mm-hmm. a guess. Let's get everyone thinking. Animation? Nah. No? Okay. I'm not, I'm not gonna give you any clues, but, uh, cause I don't want to disappoint anybody. People will be like, oh, it's that? Uh, really? But, uh, no. Nice. I feel so bad cause I can't think of the actress's name, uh, from, she was in Luke Cage, and then she popped up in Age of Ultron. And she's one of the few actors that actually had two different roles in the MC. No idea. Who was that? Uh, she was the sister of Cottonmouth in Luke Cage. Oh god, I know. Uh, forget her name. Uh, all right. Well, it's like, it took forever to get my kids to bed tonight, so I'm I'm barely coherent. And then she was the mother of the 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 child who was killed in um by one of t- you know things that uh, Tony Stark did. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, that's what she caused him. That she, that's who she was. Yeah, remember Alfred Woodard? No. Oh yeah. Was that remember? Alfred Woodard? Was was is in Age of Ultron? Yes. Oh, it's, God. it's after he gives this Civil speech. War. Yeah, she's in Civil War. Oh, Civil War. That's it. After yeah, she gives. That's why I was confused. That's why I know what you were talking about. Yes, yes. It was. It was because of the the what happened in Age of Ultron. That's what it was. There you go. He was on her. Her son was on some kind of mission in uh, Lakovia or whatever the name of that made up country was, and uh, he was killed. And that's right. It was after he gives a speech at MIT in Civil War. Right. So. Um, so yes. So we know that there is always hope that that can happen. I. So. You know. Look, it's, it's, like I said, it was awesome to be a part of it. It just means that I can be in, like, you know, Ryan Johnson's new trilogy. Or I can be in, you know, I, I've got my, you know, I've got my, my geek cred now. And so now I can just sort of jump to another franchise in another universe. Well, I don't think... Has being, well, see, real quick, has being on The Punisher kind of opened you up a little bit? Like, do you find yourself getting more calls for auditions? Are people reaching out to you more that you have some uh, exposure in a, a pretty big property like this? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, it's definitely given me a lot more exposure and visibility and, um, yeah, I've had more opportunity for sure. For sure. I don't think it's completely shown itself yet. It's still, the show's only been out a few months, you know, but, um, yeah, I mean, you know, for lack of a better word, I'm well known now. Like people know who I am now. Do you know what I mean? Like people knew me, kind of knew me a little bit and people in the industry certainly knew me, but like, you know, I have like fans now. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, it's a different sort of category of mm-hmm. actor. Um, not necessarily better or worse it's just different um and i think for me that was always the, the end the end game with this was hopefully this opens more doors you know gives me more opportunities to do stuff but yeah i think so well okay. they haven't started filming episode nine right so wait what i don't think they've have they started principal photography on nine yet episode nine? Oh, oh, episode i was like episode nine of what show um <laughs> no, i don't think so so you know Look, jj if you're listening i know i know i there was a there was a, a hot minute where I was like tweeting constantly to Ryan Johnson, teasing like you really need me in your in your new uh, in your new uh, trilogy, but uh, I didn't get to him. I got to Hamill, but I didn't get to him. Could be the the purple milk farmer, <laughs> <laughs> the owner the owner of that giant milk milky creature. Yes, yes. Hey, stop sucking my stop <laughs> sucking my my pet's teeth, Skywalker. Back to your hole. Them teats are for me. I don't know if that's the voice I'm going to use. I'm just trying it out. Yes, yes. You're just experimenting, finding the space. Exactly. I could be. Come on. There, there's a place for for me in that universe. I feel it. I, I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna. Just gonna go with my gut and just know it's gonna happen. All right. So, so what about? <clears throat> I'll throw this at you. If uh, if Abrams or or Ryan Johnson came to you and said, "Oh, be in this movie," and um, uh, Tarantino came to you and said, "Be in my Star Trek movie." And they were filming at the same time. Star Wars. Okay, just making sure. So you're you're a Star Wars guy through and through. Yeah, I I don't really care for Star Trek. Sorry, everybody, it's not my thing. I don't dislike it, but I never. The only real great memories I have of Star Trek, honestly, are like my grandparents. I used to go visit my grandparents all the time when I was a little kid. My parents mm-hmm. would drop me off at their house, and um, they had a little black and white television, and like they got you know five channels on it. Um, Star Trek always seemed to be on the old Star Trek, and I. Right. Uh, those are like I, they're like sort of like fond memories of like watching it and kind of kind of thinking it was interesting and weird, but never as good as Star Wars. 
Um, but yeah, you know, I, I really dug the movies. Like, I dug the old movies. I, dug, I, I love Wrath of Khan, and I love Search for Spock, and I actually like The Voyage Home is kind of funny, I think way ahead of its time and underrated. Um, I like some of those movies, but, like, it just never, it never grabbed me. I gotta say, I'm a huge Tarantino fan, so to work with him would be pretty badass. Right, uh, and that that is why I specified the Tarantinos. Yeah, no, I hear um, that's tough, man, because I would say the two most, almost, probably the two most influential movies to me as, like, a nerd and, like, a sort of pop culture fan growing up were Star Wars and Reservoir Dogs. So, I, but, yeah, gotta go to Star Wars. Even if it's a Stormtrooper, I gotta go Star Wars. All right. Now we know where your allegiance lie. Yeah, you can just stick me in that camp. <laughs> so, so, so besides Star Wars, is there a dream role that you've had, that you have that, uh, um... Also, you know, besides Star Wars, that, that you'd want to do, even if they were going to make a, a movie out of one of your favorite books or a play or anything like that. Oh, man, I, I don't know if there's like a dream. I mean, I have like I have like dream roles in terms of like if they ever remake X, I want to be okay. That role. Um, like I'm a huge Robert Altman fan. Mm-hmm. Um, he made a movie called The Long Goodbye with Elliot Gould. Yes. I'm a big seventy. I'm a big seventies film nerd. Um, that's my decade of of movies, and I'm a huge Kubrick fan too. So like. Um, I mean, I think I would make an absolutely fucking spectacular Jack Torn, just saying. <laughs> I think I could fucking knock that out of the park. I know that I could. All right. It would be so much, and you know what's interesting? I think it'd be even more over the top, and, but you'd accept it easy, more easily. Right. Sit with that first. But, you know, I, I do, I have like these dreams that are remake The Shining and cast me as Jack Torrance, or the remake, they're going to do a, a proper Ghostbusters role, and I'll get to play Venkman. You know, I'll get to play like Oscar Venkman. Oscar Venkman, folks, the baby from Ghostbusters. Not called Venkman, but I'm imagining he was raised by his dad, by his stepfather. And, um, <laughs> I'd actually watch that. That'd oh, Ghostbusters. You would watch that movie? Is that what you said? Absolutely. Yes. That sounds like a good idea. Come on. So, yeah, I, uh, yeah. It's more like I want to work with certain directors. Like, that's my dream. Like, I would kill to work with John Carpenter. Like, that would just make my whole life worth living. Um, I'd love to bring Kubrick back from the dead and work. Well, yeah. But, yeah. Twin Peaks. I'm a huge Twin Peaks fan. Like a crazy, crazy Twin Peaks fan. I would, my, I would love to be in like, oh man, watching Twin Three was just the whole time I was like, I want to be in this so badly. Killed me. That killed me. It was so good. Um, there you go. I don't want to cool. be Mutt Williams, Indiana Jones Five. You don't? No. No. <laughs> That's the thing. Like, there what's that? Be, well, there shouldn't even be a Mutt Williams. That's what I mean. That's what I mean. Yeah. Just stop. Just stop, Spielberg. Because I keep reading all these things about. The, Indy 5, and I'm just like, ugh, same writer as Indy 4. Stop. Stop. As much as I love Harrison Ford, I just cannot see him doing another in the end. No, he needs to just stop. Just stop. Just stop. And I, and I want them to not do any more, period. I don't want Chris Pratt. I don't want whoever. Like, just, just stop. Not everything has to be resuscitated, beaten to death. That being said, I think I'd watch the... I think there's a story there. Hold on, hold on. You could take the death of Han Solo and the death of Indiana Jones within, like, a five-year period. <laughs> is there any... Suicide is already, in this world? If they already ripped that, I already thought, oh, I can survive. So this and you time, want it I again? I can, yeah, I think it could be all right. I think there's... I, I, now, being for real, I honestly think there's a story there. If they were to do the death of Indiana Jones, like, literally, the like, the true grit version of Indiana Jones, I think that would be awesome. Yeah, I. but, it, but it's not... I almost feel like it's not for me to like Ryan Johnson that thing, like give it to somebody I else. That. You know, I get give, up more give with it, that. Yeah, yeah, give it some uh, some different texture and set it in like a weird place. I I definitely buy I definitely buy Indiana Jones being the way Luke Skywalker is in Last Jedi more than I bought Mark Hamill being or Luke Skywalker being the way he was in Last Jedi. You get me? I hear you. I could see I could see that happening. That made that would make more sense. To you. Not to get into did I like Last Jedi or didn't I like? Oh uh, well, I, 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 I have to ask now. Happened. Um, I have mixed feelings. This is a movie that we cannot stop talking about on this podcast. This is like the fifth or sixth time we have discussed this. <laughs> yeah, I saw you had a whole episode. Yeah. We had a couple. A couple <laughs> it's, been, it's been a thing. Well, how could it not be? It's the return of Luke Skywalker. Like, you have to... I don't know, man. My my The long and the short of that one, it, was, it didn't feel like a Star Wars movie, and it was hard for me to get on board with it because it didn't feel like a Star Wars movie. Um, but it didn't, it's not that it didn't feel like a Star Wars movie because of the way a lot of people are saying, like, the way it was edited or the way it was this, the way it was that. I just thought the choices they made for some of those characters, and yeah, it's 30 years on, I get it. It did, it just didn't match up with my, with my own thoughts and feelings about those. And it just felt, it just, it felt so disconnected that it was, it was hard to, it was hard to watch. For me. I felt very disconnected. That's all. And I assume you mean by the main thing being Luke, uh, 
disconnecting from the force and being a curmudgeon. <laughs> yeah, I had I had a real problem with that. I didn't think that that was you know they had this whole thing about like it kind of started in Force Awakens anyway for me where it was like you know these are your heroes. Mm-hmm. Now the thing the thing about Star Wars it wasn't a super complex you know like that's not what Star Wars was for me. Star Wars was a fairy tale and fairy tales have depth and fairy tales have layers and they're complex in their own ways. But it's 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 the Joseph Campbell power of the myth heroes journey, which, which is has layers and layers, like I said. But it's not super psychologically in so many different ways, mm-hmm. and not so so. At the end of the day, you know, this trio of heroes saved the universe, and they were my heroes, and they were my they were sort of like yeah, they weren't real, but you're a kid, you hold them up as what's the word, you know, like uh, emblems or or uh, uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm brain farting. What's the word I'm looking for? Uh. Totems, examples. Yeah, totems, sure. Yeah, exa- Yeah, whatever the <clears throat> whatever a fancy word for totem. All right, fancy. <laughs> but uh, sorry, my daughter was a psychology major. No, it's good. So, so I, so you hold them up in this regard, and you're like, and it means something. To, and it, and it's, you know, I think a lot of us learned a lot of our sort of like morals from Star Wars, you know, and our sort of like right and wrongs and good and bad and evil and all that stuff. And and to see these characters thirty years later, just they basically fucked everything up, right? They are responsible for the First Order. They're responsible for the universe being in such a shitty place. And, you know, Han was a bad father, a bad husband, uh, you know, put himself in exile and almost killed his nephew and all these things. It's just like, I don't want that from these characters. Like, go make a different movie. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't want my hero sullied in that way. Those kinds of heroes. They're a different kind of hero. They are, they're not people who exist in this world. And I think they're trying to do something with these characters to give them so much more depth and so much more edginess because we have to have that now. And it's like, can't we just, you know, I would have rather they just like did away with those characters and started a whole, like, that would have been much more pleasurable for me. Um, even Obi-Wan wasn't a dick in Star Wars, you know, like, yeah, he, he realized he messed up and he, you know, went into exile on Tatooine. But like, I don't know, man, it was like a vibe and a feeling that didn't feel right. It like hurt my stomach watching it. Force it, Awakens, I could, I could get behind a little bit, but Last Jedi, man, I don't know. I don't know. It's funny, because I think you're hitting onto something that it seems to be a, more and more of a trend uh, in movies, and that is <clears throat> taking heroes, but making them flawed, you know, bringing them down to our level, not having those high-on-the-pedestal heroes anymore. I mean, like with Superman and Batman. It, exactly. Movies. Which is funny, because the reason... It works with Marvel as Marvel's always done that. Their characters have always been flawed in some way. Yeah. But in DC and Star Wars, they were oh, these... And Batman's always been her. It works right. for Batman, too. But they were these larger-than-life characters that were these totems of, you know, greatness that we were supposed to aspire to. And now they've been drugged down to our level, and, and a lot of people have a hard time with that. Devil's Advocate is what I do on the show. Um, <laughs> I'm going to hang up. Name, name one good from that era. From which one. era? Before the movie, before Superman, before, let's say Crisis. Let's go from 1938. I mean, name me one that doesn't have, that, like, one. Uh, one point, man. There's no good stories. Like, they're great examples of moral paragons, but they don't make for, like, yeah, Speed of Clay here. Luke Skywalker has Speed of Clay. Like, he's impulsive and he's reckless and he rushes out of high school before he's ready. Han Solo yeah, is arrogant and he dick learned, with a heart of gold, you know? But he like, learned through that trilogy. But he learned through that trilogy how to be, Correct. like, a righteous dude, you know? Correct. But, I mean, even even Han Solo is, oh, this is of grandeur. You know, like, Luke kind of buys into his own I'm, I'm Luke Skywalker by the end of Jedi. And, you know, like, these are, like I said, like, if you're going to tell stories in reality, because, like, like I said, the, the big flaw with the old deeds in that example is that, until like they're not a whole lot of great points, and when there are really in the Bronze Age, it's when they marveled up the, you know, like. Yeah. But, I, not a, but I think there is edginess. But do you not think that there's edginess in that original trilogy? There is. No, there's, there's plenty. That's yeah, why, that's why. That's, that's why I mean. Like that was the right yeah. amount. But I think then to take those characters and then add on this extra layer of oh, and then thirty years later they learn they they haven't learned a damn thing. And made, I don't know if it's, in, I don't know if I agree with that. I mean, I don't know if they don't learn a damn thing. So much as like you know, life can, you know, even when even when we win the day, that doesn't mean we're flawless. You know, we we have issues, we have ups and downs, we have good and bad days, and life is a constant struggle of trying I, to improve on the people that we work with. Before. I don't, disagree. yeah, I don't disagree with you. I I just think that 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 has a place in other movies and other sort of like you in and other in other kinds of movies. I just feel like they 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 went they the way you were talking to me about like my journey in the Punisher, like they took a journey with those characters from New Hope through Return of the Jedi. 
that was just really magical and brilliant. And people found, you know, Han Solo found his heroism and Luke Skywalker found his adulthood and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You can go on down the list and like everyone, you know, there's a lot of redemption to be had. And I just think that like, to me, that was a story. Um, and I don't, not to say I didn't want, I wouldn't have liked to see more stories with them having facing challenges. It just felt like such a gigantic, and maybe it's because it's 30 years later, but it still just felt like such a gigantic leap for those characters to now be such flawed people 30 years later. Like they were all super flawed. And it was like flawed for flawed's sake just to give so much conflict to a new trilogy. And it just I guess felt that's, I hear where you're coming from. I guess that's what I liked is that it it's is okay to be wrong. You know, people. you can just admit that you're wrong. <laughs> I'm a writer. That's what I get all the time. It's a series of right. books you're wrong about. Yeah, there, well, there you so. go. <laughs> Sorry. Do you feel that it would have been easier to accept if there was a movie before this that showed them on the journey that got them to where they are? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. I'm not against taking a character to a different place or even to a darker place. I just felt like, again, like the last, the image I have of these are they're like, they are my like childhood heroes. And it's like, no, that now, now it's like, no, they're not. They're assholes like everyone else. And you're like, ah, oh. it just, Cause... it felt gross. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, the thing with Last Jedi is, at the end, it becomes, in a way, a redemption story for Luke. You know, he he comes back to the Force, and he uses it to help the remaining Rebels escape onto the Falcon, but with we didn't have just, enough time with, with him before. just for men. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, the Force projection, you see the best version at all. Right. Was that the best, best version, though? It looked it looked really, like, bad hair dye, but I'm just... <laughs> yeah. Well, his head, it was for me. Yeah. Right. Wow. Well, Sorry, continue. <laughs> but um, but we didn't spend enough time with him on the journey to where he got to well, that low point, you know. And I think that's where a lot of people had a problem with. It was hard. It was like hard to accept him in that place after not seeing him for thirty years, and suddenly mm -hmm. to find him in that place. And they just didn't have enough. We just didn't spend enough time with him in the movie either to really well, understand the story. Anymore. You know, he's a side play. It's Ray's story. <laughs> I think that's the hardest. I think that's the thing a lot of people have a hard time is that this story is no longer about main characters. You know, it's about the people that are taking their place. Yeah. And I think people still want it to be Luke Skywalker's story, and not just Luke Skywalker as as a um, a bit player or, or a small player. Right. You know? I just don't find those new actors compelling, even remotely, as compared to those. And and also, opera. also, if you're going to bring you know, somewhat, I think to Michael's point is if you're going to bring back. Luke Skywalker, uh, Mark Hamill into the movie, you're using him to draw people in. So that's going to disappoint people when he's a big character. And not only is he a big character, he's a big character that went on this huge journey from the last time you saw him. And you'd have, you're confused on why he's at this place without us really understanding it. You know, when, when he throws the lightsaber over his shoulder. So it's again, it's just hard for people to accept. And I, I agree with you, JD, that yes, he was the big character now, but it's just like Michael's original point, then just don't have him in it. Just have a whole new story with new characters. Yeah, but that's not what's going to work. And you and I both, you know, when it comes to selling stuff, you needed those three characters. Yeah. You needed them to, to get people in. Because people are like, what? I want to see this movie about these new characters. Like, you got to throw a story. See, I, like, and again, everything they've done with Luke, I thought was awesome. It was not what it would do. You know? Like, what, not what everybody wanted. It was, it's better than what they did. Extended Luke actually does. Like, I find that hilarious about the EU being wiped out of continuity. It, this series is much kinder to them than, than what the EU did, mm -hmm. you know? So, well, that's me. I, I, listen, I, I, throw, I throw logs on the floor. This was, a, <laughs> uh, this was the, you know, it's amazing that this was the movie because I, I it was not the movie I expected at no, all. Me neither. all uh, I was pretty shocked. I saw it twice in a row, too. I saw it uh, the Thursday and Friday that it opened. And, uh, cause I, and I couldn't wait to see it a second time because I was like, do I really feel these things that I'm feeling right now? And I saw it a second time. I was like, oh, wow. I really, like, I still feel the way, like, what I'm telling you is how I, how I'm describing how I feel about it is how I felt about it. I saw it. It's so hard for me to accept because I don't, I don't see myself watching those, that movie. I really don't. Like, I don't know. Dave and I had such a weird experience with, we reviewed it on the show and we were both like, we both did not know how to feel about it the first time. And we're kind of, but both found ourselves defended it more than we expected. And I saw it a second time. And I have, it was the second thing that I actually I, I clicked with, and I realized why I did like it much. Mm. Because I felt the same way, where I was like, it was not the movie I was in. Even though I tried to tell myself, I, yeah, no expectations, totally cold. But it's so hard to hang on. To, it's so hard not to hang on to your expectations character. Right. And I think the movie is ending in the way that it does challenge those notions, and some people really reject that premise. I mean, like, if anything, I mean, like I said, this is like the fifth or sixth episode that we had like a debate about this this particular movie. <laughs> yes. So I mean, like, it, it, it it's so weird how. It does spark 
which I don't know yeah. if it's a good thing or a bad thing for me, but I'd, I'd rather talk about movies than not talk about movies, you know? Right. Yeah, I, I, agree. I agree. It was it was definitely, it def- there was something to it that made people either really like it or really dislike it. And so that is, you have to give, you have to give him props for that. He didn't take a safe route out. Although I will say that there was safe stuff in that movie. There was some stuff in that movie, like, aside from the debate we're having about sort of character development and the original trilogy and all, I thought the second act was atrocious. Like that whole stuff on Canto Bite and all that stuff. I was just like, please, please stop. Like I thought some of the some of the performers were terrible. I thought Benicio del Toro was god awful, and I don't know who, what movie he thought he was in um, <laughs> with his stutter. Casino Royale. Yes, yeah, something. It was just like that whole that whole subplot. It, it reeked of like it reeked of the prequels to me. I just, I, I couldn't stand, I just can't, couldn't stand some of the a- new actors they threw into the movie. I just, oh my God. It just, I found it like so slow and torturous at times. And I just, just shoddy story. So like whatever you thought about the characters and all that and like how they handled the original I just thought like take all of that out of it. There wasn't much left for me to enjoy about that on its own. Aside from that, I found it to be very, very messy. Messy and slow. <laughs> so anyway, that's my two cents. Real quick, uh, something we didn't mention on the show before. I heard this on... Another podcast, uh, last week that they were, or two weeks ago, it was, they were reviewing the movie. And, um, the one thing that they were talking about is they got the science right in the scene where, um, the, they fly the ship at war speed into the Imperial fleet and it blows up and there's no sound, right? Like, it's very scientific. That was, no com- cool. that was cool. That was badass. Right. However, when they're, <laughs> the rebel ships, as they run out of gas, if you're in outer space, if you're traveling in a direction, you're just going to keep traveling in that direction, even if you run out of gas. But well, the ship. Go on Google Maps and go find, you know, find the nearest gas station. <laughs> but in the, but the ships in the movie, and I didn't think about it, but when I watched it, but when they pointed it out, I'm like, oh my God, it, it, it is what happens. The ships fall out of space. Really? The, the medical frigate, as it runs out of gas, as they talk about it not having any fuel, you see it like falling. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Which part, I'd like to read this article, ask the author, which part of science goes into effect when one uses the midichlorians in their mind to no, lift things? Like, no, this I, is like, these things just make my eyes white. Like, I don't understand how people can argue it, it, the science of Star Wars. No, no, they were, just, they were just pointing out the irony that they, they made sure they got the science right by having no sound in that big explosion, but yet... But is that because they're adhering to science or adhering to something that looked artistic? Eh, they're probably more artistic. Yeah, I mean, that's why, because everything, we have seven movies where shit blows up in space and it's a loud boom, and this is the one time it didn't. Like, I would attribute that more to art than to science, but everything in this, everything in these has to be scrutinized and run through a microscope over and over again. Again, they, they, they hit they hit a home run on, we'll talk about this. Yes. You know? All right, so everyone look for Michael in episode nine. Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> not any, not anymore. So, uh, um, yeah. so, so we, we're... Uh, wow, we're over an hour at this point. Um, yeah, I'm going to have to bounce soon, gentlemen. Yes. Yeah, so do you have any projects coming up that people should keep an eye out for? Um, what do I got going on? Um, we're knee-deep in pilot season right now, so I've, I've been auditioning a lot and uh, hoping to uh, have some good announcements soon about a, a new show. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I co-wrote and, and producing a movie that I'm going to also be in that we're uh, – that we have in development right now, a sort of sci-fi relationship film that we're looking for some financing for. And um, also have a, a TV pilot that I wrote with a screenwriter friend that we're uh, shopping around and we've got some meetings and pitching coming up for that. That's about dads in Brooklyn, which is something that I know a lot about because that is what I am. And um, we got a little, like I said, a little something cooking with Marvel, which I can't talk about, but uh, hopefully we'll talk about soon. And um, yeah, you know, just um, just continuing my journey and, and trying to get to as many Comic-Cons as possible. I, I um, You know, I have a, some Comic Cons coming up. I'd love to go to more. Um, love for the fans to reach out to uh, anyone and everyone to uh, get me there, so I can meet you all and you know and uh, shake hands and give hugs and mourn with you for my character. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know that's uh, I, I just you know excited to continue this journey of like you know being being in this universe and being part of this fandom and being part of this geek world and um, you know uh, yeah just uh, see where the journey takes us. And uh, where's the best place for people to follow you on social media? Yeah, you can reach me. Uh, you can reach me on Instagram. I'm uh, Michael underscore Nathanson. Um, I think if you just type in Michael Nathanson, my name comes up as a little blue check mark because I'm fancy like that. <laughs> um, on Twitter, I'm M underscore Nathanson one. That's M 
like Michael underscore Nathanson one. Um, obviously, Michael Nathanson was taken. M Nathanson yeah. was taken. M Nathanson one was taken, etc. Cetera, et cetera. <laughs> um, Mr. Underscore. Yeah. Yeah. Please reach out. Come say hi. Tell me how much you liked me. I love hearing that. Um, don't say anything nasty because I won't respond and I'll just block you because I don't believe in nastiness on social media. I think it's idiotic. Um, not the place for it. And um, yeah, come say hi and I'll, I'll probably write back to you. As you guys know, I'm I'm pretty uh, pretty good about uh, about writing people back. Oh yeah, no, this is you know everything's been great with uh, putting this together. You're very responsive. Yeah, sorry um, it took a little while, but uh, we made it happen. Yes. Um, yeah. so, so the question that we normally wrap up on, Uh-oh. it's, it's an easy one. I think, how do you measure success? One day at a time. No. Um, wow. How do you measure success with a really big ruler? <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I think it's about, I think it's all about, um, being grateful. You know, I think it's all about humility and grace. I think it's how you handle it. Um, and it's like, you asked me and you're like, man, you got to be in this thing and then you died. And like, how do you, how do you deal with that? And it's like, I told mm-hmm. you, you know, like I'm, I'm the minute I got cast in this, I, it was, that's, you know, that's, you measure success by, by the, by your experiences and by, and by, and by how you, how you relate to those experiences and how you then give those experiences back to, you know, and I think it's with, I think, you know, you got, just got to love what you do and um, have a story to tell and be passionate about it. And sometimes you'll get to do it as an actor, just in my case. And sometimes I'll do it as a writer, some of the producer. But no matter what, like, if I can keep telling stories and people still want to listen to them and enjoy them, no matter where, no matter how, like, that's success. And, you know, I've, you got, you got to measure success also personally, too. You can never let, get too bogged down in all the bullshit and, you know, surround yourself with, with good people. Cool. Is that, is that a good answer? I don't know. That, that, pretty- that's a, that is a perfect answer. And deep question. I, yes. And it's funny because we'll also, uh, ask it of repeat guests. I love the question because people will change their answer over time as well. Um, cool. So, so thank you for doing this. Yeah, man, it's a pleasure. You guys are really fun. Cool. And, uh, don't forget if you haven't done so yet, which if you're listening to this show, I'm sure you have, uh, make sure you go and watch the Punisher on Netflix and, uh, definitely check out the episode of Madam Secretary that, uh, that Michael is on because it is very topical in today's world. That's all I'm going to say. Yes. Um, and one request for you. We need a Sam Stein Funko. Help me make this a reality, <laughs> Boba. Yes. I, you've seen my pleas on social media, and Funko keeps toying with me, pun intended, but I want one. I need one. I just So I would just say, that's my only to the, to the fans out there. If nothing else happens in my career and I get a Funko, I can die a happy man. So that's how I measure success, y'all. <laughs> So on that note, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as always, thanks for listening, and don't let your cake be caught in the door. Have a good one. Hi, thanks for sticking around today's show and listening to this little addendum. For those of you who know, I'm J.D. Oliva, the new guy on Superhero Speak. been with the show about five months now, and this has been a really cool experience, getting to talk with Dave and John every week and meeting new people and getting people actually listening to our thoughts. And it's been it's been really cool. But as some of you guys know, um, I joined the show the first time because I'm a writer and I was a guest and I was promoting a Kickstarter I ran last year. Well, um, since that time, you know, the comic Red Sunrise is being drawn, and in the meantime, I've been writing two different novels. And both of them are now finished, and as of today, they are officially launched. And it's kind of um, a thank you to the Superhero Speak uh, nation, our listeners. I'm going to offer you one of my novels called Hawk Hollow, and it's going to be absolutely free on the SuperheroSpeak.com website. So if you go to the SuperheroSpeak.com, you're going to see... Um, you're going to see a link to my book. You're just going to click on it, and you'll be able to download it right away. And I, I'd love to hear what you guys think. It's a little um, mystery horror thing called Hawk Hollow. And uh, it, it's been a book that is actually supposed to be a comic. But um, I lost my, my artist partner about four years ago. And uh, the book's kind of floated in limbo, and I've been working on it ever since. And it's kind of found new life as a novel. So, um What's pretty cool about this is not only am I offering you guys a, a novel, but in the novel itself, there's going to be a link to a Dropbox folder that's going to show you kind of the process that Hawk Hollow went through. It's going to have the unfinished book itself. We have eight unfinished pages. Uh, three are colored. The rest aren't. 
And it's going to have the scripts, actually, for the four-issue Hawk Hollow miniseries of what it would have been in 2013. Um, that's included with the book. You're also going to get an audio commentary from me talking about the story of how I created Hawk Hollow and the journey that it went from being a comic pitch in, in 2012 to the novel that it is today in, in 2018. So I hope you guys really enjoy it. Again, just go on to superherospeak.com, click on the link, and enjoy the book. Thank you guys very much for supporting us and supporting the show. And uh, thank you for welcoming me into this show. It's been meant a lot to me, and, and I've had a great time working with Dave and John over the last six months. And I hope to stick around for a lot longer and uh, and get you guys listening to my inane thoughts and, and read more of my stuff. So thank you guys very much.